upon Yes, now you can hear me. Hello. Yeah, yeah, now I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, uh, you, can, you can start. Yeah, you okay. are muted your mic. But yeah, go okay. ahead. Um, I'm Chris Salma and I'm a co founder of Areka Books. Yes, and now you can hear me. Okay. So tonight, okay, tonight I'm going to talk to you about um, publishing. And publishing is one of these uh, very difficult, uh, laborious, I always say, um, thankless, tedious and thankless jobs, okay? So if you are looking for a job, you might not want to be a publisher. <laughs> it's, um, you know, okay, just to start from the beginning, you know, I was, after I came back from, I, I studied in the US and then when I came back, I was unemployed for a few years. I don't know, I was, I, I did have, jobs but they were not long, long lasting so in between i was unemployed and then i found a niche i guess in something that, that i felt that i was good at and something that would be relevant so it's important for me to do something that's meaningful something i'm passionate about something that i think is relevant to society um and so so somehow i got into publishing okay First of all, I was an editor. So I started out with this magazine. I don't know if any of you have heard this magazine. I've got a lot of things to show you. This is like a show and tell. So this is called Pulau Pinang Magazine. And I started at the end of uh, 1989. So let's say 1990, 91, 92, 93. I'm really thankful to my employers for giving me like a job where, you know, I stuck to it for about two or three years, three years. And um, I found my niche because it's about you know, it's called Pulapina Magazine, a uh, way of a uh, guide to the local way of life and culture of Penang. So actually, I was asked to do a tourism uh, publication. And I, and I thought that, well, tourism is, you know, it's very superficial, um, not really something that I want to write about. And I don't want to just rehash, you know, um, like what has been written. So this one involved a lot of like interviews and a bit of research at that time I was just like starting to research so I, I think I was a very bad researcher then but you know I got uh, a bit better as I went along mm -hmm. so then these uh Pulapina magazine there was 13 all together and it covered um a lot of local places in Penang and local people and artisans a lot of artisans actually I did a lot of interviews with artisans early earlier in my career and then um then I started to get interested in, well, uh, like urban geography or local uh, history and urban history and interested in the buildings. And I got really involved in heritage. And by that time, anyway, I was honorary secretary of the Heritage Trust. So the two went in parallel. Um, then, uh, and also plants, you know, sometimes you talk about plants. So now I'm coming back to my passion about plants. And then in 1993, I published uh, this book, which was my first book, which I did by myself. And it's called Streets of George Tan Penang. And uh, this is the one that is really about uh, the heritage of George Tan. And maybe this is kind of, it's been uh, called like the book that actually launched, launched the George Town as like a world heritage site. But then, um, so 1993 uh, onwards, so I was doing a lot of freelance writing and photography. So in those days, I was not bad as a photographer, but nothing compared to, you know, all these whiz kids like Eddie and all that these, these days, lah, you know? But in those days, because there were not that many people around. So, okay, so I took photographs and sometimes got paid for it. Uh, but I, I decided that actually uh, writing and editing is really my forte. So then I um, was doing a lot of freelance writing and wrote and co-wrote some books with my husband and as well. So mainly I was writing about Penang and I was uh, co-authoring some books with my with my husband on Perak because you know he, he writes about Perak. And then um, then we thought, hey, why don't we form a publishing company? So in 2005 we formed a pub publishing company. And now I'll go very very fast through all the books. So this was the first book that we published and it's called Penang Trends, Trolley Buses and Railways. And it's just as relevant today because there was a proposal to implement a tram 
uh, network through Georgetown. And somehow that proposal was never taken up, maybe because, not because it was expensive, maybe it was not expensive enough. But anyway, um, then wrote a few books and edited a lot of books. So Eureka Books has edited, I think, almost 50 books. I think, anyway, it's 40 something. We have a bit lost count. And uh, one of the books that we did, uh, I won't show you the earlier, earlier books because some of, some of them are sold up. But one of the books that we did, which became quite um, sort of, uh, there was a revived interest in it, was The Plague Fighter. And this is about, um, this is the, we actually republished the autobiography of Dr. Wulian Tay, and he's the one who uh, invented the N95 mask. So that's why there's a renewed interest in him. And then um, we also published, like this is the first book that we published in Malay. And now we're, I'm going back actually to, we're going back to publishing Malay books. And this is about the romance music, romance music of the Mandalay, ethnomusicology. And then this book I was working on for a long, 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 long time, like long time, more than 10 years. And this is called The Truly in Penang. And that's because I did interviews in the 1990s. Um, and then like from 1997 onwards, I started to do interviews about the Indian Muslim history because I felt that that was like a mi missing portion of Penang's history. But there was a lot of heritage around uh, in those days, you know? So just kind of like tried to map it out and try to figure out what happened and what happened to all these people. I mean, many of, uh, maybe the original people have like assimilated or they have got, they're gone or then they're no longer in Georgetown. And then, um, so that, that took me a long time, but it won, uh, won a prize. So this won the International Convention of Scholars uh, prize, book prize. Um, and that's uh, like an international prize. So I'm very happy I did that. That was like, after that, I was very exhausted. So after that, I did a, a couple of more books. One is, uh, you know, I had to do something about the Baba Nonia, and that's the Redoubtable, Redoubtable Reformer about a Penang Perak personality. And then this is the first book that I've done we, where we went to raise funds through mystarter.com and managed to raise, I think, less than 10K, but like, I can't remember exactly how much, but it was enough, you know, to do this, um, to do this book because we also had some funding from Think City. And then, uh, then we, we also have some foreign commissions. So this, uh, book is commissioned by the society, uh, the School of Oriental and African Studies. So that's a kind of kind of prestigious institution in, in the UK and they commissioned us to do this catalog. And we do a lot of architectural books as well. So this is one of the uh, books that I edited, um, which is called Resilience of Tradition. And it's about how, you know, traditions are actually used in uh, contemporary architecture and they're contemporized. Okay, and this is uh, also a couple of years back. It's called Beyond the Sea. It's, it's um, a novel that was originally in Tamil and we actually, Eureka Books actually uh, got a translation prize for it. And it was uh, uh, translated by Dr. Katigesu, which who actually passed away before this book could come out. But, you know, we are so, um, it's, so it's in memory of him as well. And then, um, more recent books. So this is, so I'm showing you more the arts and culture books, you know, rather than the strictly history books. And this is Contested Space, uh, Revisited, and it's by Dr. Gwyn Jenkins. Oh, my cat got in. So you, this is a book that you should get if you're interested in the Georgetown World Heritage Site, because it really talks about the complexity, you know, the, the um, how, do, how, the, how the World Heritage Site is interpreted, interpreted how it is contested, and um, the whole kind of effort to, to conserve it, okay? So, and it's got pictures as well, you know, of how the site uh, has been, how it has changed and so forth. And then uh, we've also done a book on performing arts and this is Ma Yong, um, which is by Professor, uh, Dato Professor Dr. Gulam Sawar Yusuf. And he's really the world authority on this um, on, on many, many performing arts and, um, and they, you know, the many interpretations of performing arts, you know, Malaysian performing arts, but his one, I mean, he, he actually studied it in the 70s. So there are many 
pictures from the 70s, which you won't be able to find. So of course the, the art evolves and there are always, you know, um, contemporary interpretations, which is very good. Um, and then um, this is also an, a book on visual arts, which we publish and it's called uh, Living Arts. And um, this one has quite a number of uh, artists, right? So it's, it's, um, it's not a catalog, but it's more like how, you know, what they think, how they do their work, how they practice, how they uh, think through the work, you know? So if you're a budding artist, this is a very good book to get because it's really like their thought process, how they approach the work. And they're all coming from different uh, angles and different fields and using different media and so forth. And the latest one that we've published, and it's just out in the bookshops, and this is by uh, Datin Patricia, and it's called One Leg Football because it's it's short stories about people with disabilities, and it's you know set in kind of Malaysia as uh, you know in a in a very classical sense, let's say, and um, I think you know it's a, this is a very good book to get as a gift as well. Um, how am I doing for time? It's only, oh, it's only 11 minutes. Okay. And this is the last book. And this is the book that we've been working on for the last few months. And I spent, uh, let's say more than a month, almost two months of my life, like doing this index, right? Um, and I, that's still, it's not perfect, but I think it's good. And um, so this Tari Raja Asal, it's actually, it's uh, the latest in a series of, you know, some of the books uh, the, the previous book was Sultan Posa, founder of Kuala Lumpur, that's uh, uh, written by my husband. So it's about his uh, family stories, which are, you know, how they got involved in so many wars and all that. So it's a reinterpretation, reinterpretation of um, some parts of Malaysian history. Okay, so um, maybe some, some things, some anticipated questions like, why do I do publishing? Well, I, I really can't imagine myself in any other job in Penang, especially because, you know, for a creative person, I think it's not easy to get jobs in Penang, right? So you kind of have to create own, your own jobs. And as you see uh, artisans at home, many of them create their own jobs, like small businesses, they're entrepreneurs. So I'm in a way an entrepreneur, I wouldn't say a, a very successful one, um, but our books, are, I think, uh, more of a critical rather than commercial success or, you know, because not every book is a commercial success, let's say. Some are, but uh, some, uh, you know, you can just break even or might even lose money. So that's why publishing is not a job to go into if you, if you want to make money, but it's a very uh, rewarding and fulfilling job, right? And uh, because author, publisher, I mean, um, it's kind of, people say, you know, how can author be publisher and or vice versa? But uh, because I think um, the things that I, I write about and that I'm very interested in is very niche. So sometimes, you know, I've written for other publishers before, but sometimes, you know, they cannot understand the, the context, you know, that, that the book needs to be in or the, the context of the readership. So, um, so when you work for a big publisher, then they, they like everything, like it's, it's main, ma mainly made for a mass market, for a larger market, mass market, and which is fine if you're writing about something mainstream. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's great if you have a bestseller, which is a mainstream publication, but then um, because we are sometimes very interested in very niche things that nobody else is interested in. Uh, and um, so, and we are trying to create that, uh, the knowledge, you know, kind of very niche kind of knowledge, which very few people might be interested in, but um, it's worth, you know, it's part of that whole um, fabric that is, is being woven, okay, which is about Malaysian history, Malaysian heritage, Malaysian culture, arts and all that. So we, we, we try to tell the stories and also to allow people to tell stories, which then allow, you know, enable a next generation of people to tell their story. So Maybe it might, uh, some of these books might be useful for people who are writing fiction, for example. Then they say, oh my goodness, how am I gonna find out about what the society used to be like, you know, before the Second World War? So then they, they say, oh, please get our books and you know, we've got all these books and then I'll recommend you can get this and this and this. So 
um, uh, because that it's it's necessary, you know, it's necessary and uh, to to write about local places, about local people, local personalities, and and uh, culture, culture, you know, uh, the arts and all that, and um, then people, you know, get a, the sense of okay, what the society used to be like, what is the potential, and you know, we have a very um, let's say interesting multicultural society, but it's sometimes uh, if you don't have, you don't get the nuance and the complexity, then people can just um, become, I mean, they, they might have a very superficial understanding of, of history, for example. So we try to write books that, that fill that vacuum because we think that, you know, a lot of history is not taught in schools and in schools they have to simplify everything and kind of make it like an assemblage of facts. But then there are actually many, many stories that are worth telling. Um, so anyway, so this is what we do, and um, let's see what else uh, would, would interest you about publishing. Um, publishing is, is a laborious process, like I said, tedious and thankless, okay? So publishing is like, uh, first you get a manuscript. Okay, first people say, oh, I want to write, I'm writing a book. So uh, can you tell me how to write, okay, how long this should, book should be, or you know, how much it will cost? Then you know, but how much what would cost? So, you know, we actually cannot get any sense of what is being written, what somebody is writing, working on until we see at least a first draft of the manuscript. And then then only we, we know that, okay, this is this is what it's about and all that. So I would say, uh, first email me, okay, email and give me a synopsis and, um, you know, give me a first draft at least and, uh, and then most of the time, actually, we, we don't publish fiction at the moment. We are mainly publishing nonfiction, but there are exceptions. Like I told you, there was there's this book because it's kind of fiction, but it's, you know, really like nonfiction because it's based on, you know, uh, I, well, when you read it, you'll see. And it's, it's got a lot of context, let's say. And so it is, is a, a delightful collection of short stories, which um, very gives a very kind of human touch, and then and then this one is also, this is also fiction. So this is the very rare books of fiction that we've published. But this is really set in Penang, and when you read it, like my friend's father read it and he said that it was just like in Penang in the 1940s, 50s. You know, it was actually written uh, just after the Second World War. So uh, it's about the Indian National Army and, you know, love story. Of course, it's a love story, but it's very historical context. So um, then the other thing is that um, uh, then, you know, it goes through a long process of sometimes fact checking, especially if it's history. And uh, then, you know, then it goes through the layout, the design goes back. And then sometimes you have to do indexing, proofreading, and all that. Lah. So it, it's a long time before this baby is born, you know? Oops, I think my battery ran up. Okay, so there's no more light, but uh, you can still see me. Okay, so um, so I I think that's all I want to say for the moment. You can ask me any sort of questions, and then I'll just hand over to Eddie. Okay, so uh, I think, uh, so Eddie is, uh, um, okay, it's one of, he's written a book, and we published his book, and I'm very excited to introduce uh, Eddie Zuan. He's doing his, uh, his, he wrote about his journey to Tibet, but it's more about what he was thinking, you know, his, his, his perception of what he, was, what he saw. And he's also a brilliant photographer and he's, he's co-written, he's also got a co-author, co co-photographer. Co um, so you can switch to Eddie, right? Or should I talk some more? <laughs> Eddie? Hang on, yeah. Uh, Eddie can just uh, go on, yeah? So is it my turn now? Yes, yeah. yes. Go ahead. Okay, all right. Hello, everybody. My name is Eddie Zuan in Musa. So as Madam Ku has mentioned, so uh, uh, I publish a book. Uh, the title is The Cycle Empire. Uh, it's, it mainly discuss about Tibet. And of course, I publish it under Areka. So I'm kind of like bringing over the discussion of, of from 
when I uh, publishing to from the initial processes and then now I'm kind of presenting mm -hmm. to you. The author perspective mm -hmm. of that, the output of it, right? So, uh, so first of all, uh, I was a photographer. Uh, I was again Matthias, then a photographer, and then and then now I'm trying to pursue uh, academic field. So because mm -hmm. I'm really taking my my masters in visual erotology in USM. Uh, uh, I'm supervised by the venerable Dr. Johan. Just want to give him a shout out here. So on to my book, all right? So the project of the writing the Cycle Empire book was initially stemmed from these uh, feelings of uncertainties regarding certain premises and concepts, and you know, specifically onto the notion of identity and existentialism. So this is the book right here. I will kind of oh, sorry. I will kind of like show you uh, later some parts of it just to just to introduce the book. So uh, going back to the idea of notion of identity and existentialism, right? So the questions really that me and my friend uh, Tristan Yap, who is the co-author, uh, uh, sorry, who's the yeah, he's the photographer. We we discussed together. I'm the main author, but but he's definitely there. His thoughts are all there. So we were addressing the questions of why are we like this, uh, as in like how is somebody somebody how is someone like this? How does a group of people come together to a culture? And, and kind of like uh, practice that culture. How is culture formulated? What basis forms culture, right? So these are, these are kind of like the questions that we have and, and we wanted to address. So the book, the Cycle Empire book, essentially is our exploration of these questions. It allows us to address these questions, uh, a conduit of, of sorts. So we selected Tibet in order to kind of strategize our arguments so why is it bad? Well, uh, usually when we would like to have a certain kind of uh, exhaustive contemplation of, of a particular premise or concept, we would try to pick one extreme end from the current ideas that we have. So in this case, Tibet fulfilled this prerequisite. Uh, so Tibet is a country that is entirely highland, uh, is uh, uh, entirely surrounded by mountains. So therefore everyone Every Tibetans, I would classify uh, as mountaineers. So this contrasts us because uh, Malaysia and many other countries around the world, majority by the way, are waterfront based. What I mean by this? So what we are an industry, uh, a, a nation that was premised upon the idea of, of, of the water sea maritime industry. And then of course, from there, we have our uh, industrial age. Now in the case of Malaysia, we are being colonized also because of that. Uh, access of waterfront and everything, and here we are. Tibet, on the other hand, have no contact to sea. They are entirely in the middle of land. There is no sea at all. So it provides a very interesting anthropology, sociological phenomenon where, where we could kind of like look into the extremes and from there we can draw upon certain ideas and conclusions, right? So the book kind of uh, uh, progresses through all of these questions. I will share screen some excerpts later from the book and, and uh, photos in order to illustrate uh, what I mean in terms of all these geographical and cultural differences. But I would like to talk about the book itself in terms of the prose. Uh, the book is kind of like, I wouldn't say it's a photo book. Uh, it does have photos, uh, quite a lot, uh, but I would actually put the ratio about 50-50 from text to photos. So the book the, the prose of the book progresses through a loop of question and answers, right? So uh, uh, that's a, so it's very contemplative in this case. It is because of this structure that the entire prose of the book is that kind, it flows in that kind of contemplative way. Now, this is a very distinctive point that I must uh, say because uh, this, I would like to clarify through this that my book is not a factual book. It's not, a, it's, uh, so it's not a factual, it's not a travel guide. Uh, it is not a religious book either, so I'm, I'm, I'm afraid if you would like to understand on Tibetan Buddhism and the whole concept of Tibetan Buddhism, my book does not really focus on that. It does discuss on Tibetan Buddhism, surely, of course, it's Tibet and culture and all those things, but it is not any of those three genres I state above. So this was actually one of the problems that I arrived to in, the, in, the, in going back to Madame Ku, because um, in the beginning stages, we had difficulty trying to classify what book is this. And all finally, after years, I, I, I realized my book is considered as a contemplative rhetoric. So that's kind of like what it is. 
it's a contemplative rhetoric. That's the kind of like the main point I want you to leave today about my book. So the book ultimately really aims to invite the reader to read along our thought processes, right? We would like you, the reader, to, uh, shall we say, think along, uh, think alongside us as you read the text, you explore. So we hope that our rhetoric uh, of the prose will expand your thoughts. Uh, they may make you uh, be more inquisitive, uh, perhaps be more critical about what constitutes our culture and who we came to be. Like I mentioned, the, the, the notions of identity and existentialism uh, and culture, of course, both of them, right? So, and of course, you may disagree with the contents of the book. You may disagree with our prose, and that's wonderful. Uh, I, I, we, me and Tristan, I think we, we fully encourage that. But so that's ultimately what the book's about. I want, we want the book to kind of like be your starting point or uh, one of your starting points into this whole critical thinking of, 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 of understanding ourselves by having some kind of a, another alternative to look into, right? So I'm going to show you the book now. So uh, this is kind of the layout of the book, and this is one of the my favorite photos actually of the book. Yeah. So as I mentioned, uh, this is one of the few doubles, uh, double page uh, photo. But as I mentioned, because it's also pro space, so there are a lot of text as well. So it kind of like moves in between this whole uh, 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 photo to text, photo to text kind of idea. But the photo and text do not. They are not, they're both independent mediums. So the photo do not necessarily explain, uh, illustrate the text, and the text do not necessarily sub, uh, be a caption to the photos. So it, they both exist independently in the photo, in, in the book. And, and I hope you understand what I mean when you actually go through the book. So now I'm going to share screen to you, uh, some excerpt and photo, because I do think showing you this way is not so, it's not a good idea. So I'm going to share screen now to, this selection which i've shown you here i think you should be able to see it now right so the book as i said is uh, published by arika books and it's written by me and my good friend tristan so here the the point here of this excerpt i mainly want to discuss is uh we are approaching the whole project as outsiders and this is a very important point because uh we are not Tibetan scholars. Uh, I don't think we, 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 even now, I don't think we classify even remotely that, that terminology, but we do try our best to kind of critically look as an outsider point of view, uh, an extreme case, like I mentioned, the waterfront to Tibetan mountaineers. So that is kind of like the, the very first thing I want people to understand, uh, which is why I mentioned that this should not be taken as factual, but more as theories contemplative in nature. So. This is the first one, the first image I wanted to show in this presentation because it highlights a key idea of how we contextualize and compose and, and, and compose our images. We kind of just juxtapose teams in this way. So in this particular instance, you could see uh, an old man and and what I presume is his grandson by the gesture of the hand. So it is this kind of just a position that kind of retain itself throughout the entire book, the whole idea of, of, of conflicting concepts, which certainly the book does kind of uh, uh, elaborate on that as well. This is another example of, of that kind of just a position which, which I mentioned is quite prevalent across the entire book, where in this case, it is a monk and money to what conventional uh, concept tend to be mutually exclusive, but here we kind of like bringing it together. Uh, and there, and it is related to the prose as well, which I wouldn't really uh, uh, talk too much about here. Here's another image of Yuck. Uh, I select this image as one of the features because uh, one of the chapters itself discusses about Yuck. Yuck is this uh, cow-like animals. Uh, they're not cow. They're a, a, kind, a, a very interesting breed that is only available in these mountainous regions. So one chapter discussed about Yak entirely because Yak is fundamental in the Tibetan culture. This is uh, one of the, I find the most poignant photo of a Tibetan child. Uh, again, one important, in fact, I would argue as, a, as the author, interestingly, that the most important chapter of the whole book is actually on children 
because through our discussions and 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 reading and and, and experience, we finally realized that the most important distinct uh, distinctive feature that distinguishes our two culture, waterfront and the mountaineers, are uh, actually the childhood. So one whole chapter will be dedicated on this discussion as well. Particularly, like in this second photo here, the dynamic relationships between how a child eventually grow up to an adult and, uh, and adopts the whole culture. I think us uh, may see some certain semblance in this case as well, as we most probably try to follow our parents and, and, and guardians. But how the dynamics in this case, in Tibetan case, is, is very interesting, which also I won't, get, I won't get too much into here. And similarly, one chapter to dedicate itself on this relationship between the monk communities and the, the shall we say the regular Tibetans, uh, the ratio is quite extreme. Like in the case of, of us, waterfront nations, Malaysia in particular, the ratio of, of monk to people is quite uh, I, I wouldn't I don't I, I do not know the exact statistics, but I would assume it's even less than one percent monks are the total population, even less than 0 0.1. But in Tibet the ratio is actually pretty pretty close. We're talking perhaps a ratio of two to three or at least one to four. Uh, so these dynamics is very interesting and it, it, it one whole chapter was actually dedicated to discuss it. So I mentioned just now about the two geographical factors, didn't I? About the whole waterfront versus the whole mountaineers idea. So this is actually one of the, the main thing I would like to, to describe. So this excerpt kind of describes that. And so from here onwards, I'm going to talk about the whole idea of how this is in how this uh, this notion of geographical differences is reflective. So this is one of my actually favorite photos, uh, apart from that one, All right? So uh, this shows you how the culture and geography of Tibet is in, is interlinked. So here you can see the Tibetan prayer flags thrown all the way, you know, meters and meters and meters far ranging all the way to the horizon until it kind of like descend down to the mountain and there's a hint of the background of the Tibetan plateau and mountain at the behind there. So uh, this is one example of what I mentioned regarding the whole notion of geography and uh, culture and anthropology, how, how it's very different from us, which is very interesting point for, for the for the, uh, the, the uh, acts as the basis of the contemplation. Now Tibetan plateau you may believe that Tibetan plateau is, is either entirely snow or entirely barren. Well, that's not the case, as, a, as an example of this photo taken by us. So uh, already here, we can see the multitudes of geography and, and of course the multitudes of culture that is derived from that. And yes, there are fantastic um, instances such as this, which just kind of help to reify the whole mystical, holistic I'm a uh, perception of Tibet. Another image to highlight the whole concept of the mountaineers expect, you know. So here we could kind of like see the outskirt lifestyle of a Tibetan, which again may a, a closer look into this image will really reveal a lot of variances to us ourselves. Long drives are very common in Tibet, as this image kind of shows. Tibetan plateau again, another one to illustrate the whole concept of the variety of geographical uh, 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 geology, I suppose. An alternative look. So yes, traveling is arduous over there <laughs> and not all pavements are road. Uh, sorry, all not roads are in the pavement point. So at one point, actually, our, our the vehicle that me and Tristan we were in with that uh, it actually went off the road off beat for I think about I think almost a day worth of journey which was very interesting. So here's the final part of the whole uh, presentation. I just want to kind of like reveal how the pros of the arguments is going to be. So this excerpt kind of like reflects that. This excerpt kind of basically discusses the whole notion of of how science semiotics uh, for, for, for people who know it but science in general science simple uh, gestural color shape kind of infer all of this ideal culture 
So you will expect, I think, this kind of excerpt to, to be prevalent across the entire book. So here's an example of what I meant by culture, geography, and sign semiotics and uh, gestural all kind of merged into one. From here, we could read uh, gestural uh, ideas, prop ideas, and a whole myriad of other things. Another classic example, one of one of this is I think Tristan's uh, favorite photo, if I may say Tristan, I'm not so sure, I'm sorry. But so of this whole merger of the culture with uh, architecture, all this kind of inferences against uh, as a foreground to a whole beautiful mountain in this case, a mountainous region. This is a closer look into how much of this prayer flags uh, kind of like uh, uh, is significant to them really and there's one job oh, that i forgot to mention there's one chapter actually that just discusses about this prayer flags uh, 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 it, because it is such an important and very idiosyncratic version uh, uh, of, of of tibetan culture you will see this this color motifs appear in all almost all paraphernalia uh, available and this is the full screen version of the image of my favorite image, which I showed you just now. Uh, I, I love this image the most really because it kind of shows you this whole idea of Tibet trying to uh, retain the whole culture, but at the same time, there is this whole element of modernization that is coming now uh, into its land, uh, this, despite it not being a waterfront. But of course, uh, the dynamics of this kind of introduction of this technology and the perseverance of culture is something that's quite different from us. This is one, one of two final images which I'd like to show. So this is what this is one image which I meant. The whole idea of 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 uh, the the different dynamics of culture. What you're seeing here is actually incense, the burning of incense. Yes, those are incense. So for us, Malaysians and uh, our regions, China even, like waterfront culture, incense is associated to the joystick, right? So this is a very interesting uh, kind of alternative of what is being practiced there, where the burning of incense exists, but the manner of burning that incense, the context of it is very different. So it kind of like provides us a whole range of, of discussions to have that the, that the book actually also discuss. And with this, I close my my entire presentation. So uh, this Im uh, uh, basically all of these images I shown you here, I I didn't actually count them, but I will assume it's about one quarter of all of the images of the book. So like I mentioned, the book is text heavy and image heavy. So there are way more to uh, that I did not reveal here, which I hope that you would. Uh, uh, get into the book and, and, and experience it for yourself. So the hard copy of this book, of course, is available at Arika, Arika bookstores, and also uh, available for delivery. And I think on selected bookstores as well. Uh, I'm not so sure which bookstores in particular, but yes, uh, but they are, are all available. Yes, so I think that's it. That concludes my presentation for the moment. And um, let's get back to Madam Ku. Uh, oh, by the way, I, I just I'd like to say thank you so much for Madam Ku because without Madam Ku's uh, supervision and editorial, this would not be entirely impossible. So I owe it all to Areka for this. And hopefully there'll be more books to come once MCO settles down and it provides us more opportunity to create more books. Right, that's it for me. Uh, let's return to Madam Ku, please. And Uncle, you, you are you're still. Uncle, you are, yeah, you have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. we would actually, you know, uh, welcome any questions. And I think there are some questions in the in the Facebook, but somehow I yeah. lost the, the, you know, that page thing. Okay. Uh, that's okay. Maybe I can uh, post the questions to both of you. Uh, moment. Uh, we have quite a few comments. Um, I think a lot of people were commenting about how good uh, the photos look for Eddie. Yep. Uh, 
Okay, I think I'll address uh, the question to Eddie first, and then uh, we can close it up uh, with uh, Ms. Zhao Maya. Okay, one question to Eddie. How has China impacted the Tibetan culture, do you think, uh, through your travels and your journey and your photography there, uh, in your narrative? Did you, I assume that's what the question was asking, did you learn anything about the influence of China on Tibetan culture? Not just the modernity side, but perhaps in other aspects as well. Yeah, okay. The discourse of, of, of China's, uh, shall we say, um, influence on Tibet is, is a very wide topic. Uh, and, and I'm very sorry, I can't provide like a very simple definitive answer to that query. But I can tell you this. Uh, when I was at the Potala Palace, and Potala Palace is actually, uh, you can actually find evidence of this in my book. So on top of Potala Palace was a flag of China. So there was a flag of China erected on top of the Potala Palace. Uh, so this kind of, uh, shall we say, presence of China is quite prevalent in Tibet. Now, the notion of whether is that bad or good is too simple. It, it, it's too it's too much of a binary distinction to discuss here. But so to answer, at least in a short form as possible, is there is a very prevalent uh, presence of China in Tibet. Uh, and it has, it has improved certain infrastructures. Uh, certainly it, it enabled people like me to even go to Tibet in the first place. So that is one important distinctive feature that must be acknowledged, right? As for the bad side, uh, I, I will not get too much into here because, like I say, I'm not that uh, knowledgeable of the political of China Tibet uh, relations. Yeah. Okay, understand. Uh, okay, second question. I think it's more on the technicality of the book itself. Uh, the whole process from conception mm -hmm. until the, the it started off, there must be like, um, how do you envision the book to go from the starting point? How do you start? Uh, envisioning for the, for the production of this book until the end. Mm -hmm. How long did it take? Uh, and you know, what are the processes? What are the processes that you have to go through to get this book published? Basically, does the question make sense? Yes, yes, it does. So to first begin, um, there is two approach to the book. Uh, first of all, is my base as a photographer. So how a photographer approach. Uh, this kind of assignment is very different from how, uh, shall we say, an author uh, approaches it. So in my case, uh, one year before we actually went to Tibet, uh, I, I immersed myself in Tibetan books and uh, I read through them. I read through uh, academic journal papers to discuss about Tibet and all those things. So it's to kind of like provide a certain kind of idea of especially what is related. The, the two questions I, 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 I posited, which is on identity and existentialism. But when we arrive in Tibet, and all knowledge kind of like we put at the back of the mind and, and the photography side emerge. So me and Tristan, we are both photographers, but we are both photographers of a different way. Uh, I am very, as you can see from my books behind here, I am, I am very influenced by, by Bauf, Roland Bauf and uh, Marco Polo by Marco Yamashita. So, uh, so the approach is in that sense, which is uh, waiting, uh, being present, uh, creating the chances for serendipitous uh, composition to enable those, those moments to appear. Because we don't actually, uh, it, it's very straight photography style. So we don't like position the, the, the characters there. We, we are just in the moment and we try to be as alert as possible to capture as much as we can. And Tristan it does the same in his own way. And uh, I would like to add on to this question, if I may, because what you see in this final selection in the book, that is, I think I'm giving a rough figure. That's only 5%, I think, of all of the images that we capture. <laughs> so, How many photographs are there in the book? Uh, approximately? I, I, we didn't, I, I'm sorry, I didn't count it, but I, I think it was, I don't know, Madam Ku, uh, uh, was it? A uh, hundred, I think. Yeah, I look pretty. Yeah, I read this around so that. So, if five percent of a hundred, so that's two thousand photographs. 
Oh, uh, then then it's more than that because <laughs> I, I remember Tristan alone was about a thousand plus, and I think mine, oh, okay. mine was close to a thousand. And then so the curatorial process was arduous and long, uh, 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 especially between me and Tristan. And we actually invited my close friend Howard Tai to also come and assist us to 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 be the impartial uh, point, you know, to decide. So uh, I'm going too far. So basically, the whole process to answer your, to again, answer your question. So it was one year worth of preparation. And then uh, when we went to Tibet, unfortunately, due to financial budget and visa, China's visa restrictions, we were only given 10 days in Tibet, uh, eight to 10 days and include the travel. And then three days, uh, three days to and fro from Tibet to, to, to Malaysia. So that is the extent of the entire photographic uh, but the whole I the whole pros the whole discussion however took it went on for two years after that after the debate and then even during the editorial process with Madam Ku uh, which is amazing by the way I mean most people kind of like most people I've met and talked to they they do not like the editorial process but not me I, I really enjoyed it Madam Ku I mean laborers and others and time consuming and yeah, no, I we uh, for me especially I welcome it, you know, because it, it is it is a kind again like I say it is a negotiation of the contemplative approach that we have. So I think that's about as long as it took uh, uh, three years in total. I think uh, the the editorial process itself took about a year. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that was actually fun. Yeah, I hope I, hope I answered the question. Uh, I think you do. I think you did. Uh, I think. Uh, okay, we're running out of time. Just one last question to you. Uh, maybe you can answer in like one or two sentences. Just then okay, we'll shift uh, Madam Ko. Uh, what's your own personal plan? Immediate, long term, short term, whatever for the future. Uh, what do you do next now that you've published this book? Do you have plans uh, for the coming months or years? Uh, well, this, I can tell you one thing for sure is that this will not be the only book in my lifetime. <laughs> as long as I'm alive, I would like to keep on publishing more books and hopefully Arika would assist me more in that endeavor. Uh, uh, I was in the middle of, of, of preparing the groundwork for the, for the next book already actually and then I'm still hit and then that really leaves a lot of things uh, mm. because it's not Malaysian based so a lot of research needs to be put into that that of course MCO kind of restricted that so unfortunately my what happened to me onwards is entirely dependent on how MCO and COVID-19 kind of progress so please stay at home everyone who listened to this help me in my career please stay at home uh, and <laughs> mind your SOP all right so you, you, you go a long way to, to helping me out and medical out eventually yes Thank you so much. Thanks, Eddie, uh, for sharing. Also, on that note, I can lay that out because I think Madam Ku mentioned one of the books that was uh, published by uh, Areka was uh, on uh, the click fight, the Dr. Wu Lin Teng, right? So that leads to so the question is addressed to Quan uh, Zhongma. So, um, how has the pandemic, of course, the question everybody asks, um, affected you as a publisher, uh, whether it's the physical premises or in terms of uh, and publication plans or sales, yeah. Well, um, of course the pandemic has affected mm -hmm. everyone and the lockdown has affected everyone, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in terms of uh, books, book, our bookshop um, used to get a lot of walk-in mm -hmm. business and because of the lockdowns, so we, the, lock, the walk-ins have really decreased we are getting more online business so it has shifted to online but it still doesn't make up for you know um the the sales that that we used to get um at, in the bookshop so the thing is okay eureka books is a kind of very vertically integrated uh, operation because we're very small and um we do everything ourselves because nobody's going to do it for us so in malaysia it's not easy to get a uh, a good distributor um, that you know that will then remit the money back. That means if you you know invest in a book, then you can't see the sales directly. Maybe you see it uh, years later. And we've also had distributors who don't pay. You know, 
So in the end, we decided to do it ourselves. So, so actually, we actually handles distribution also. We handle our own distribution right. for our own books. Uh, so just to make the major bookshops like Kinokuniya, MPH, uh, Times, you know. So we get our books into the major bookshops and a few small like boutique shops. Mm. Um, so we, we handle that ourselves. And we also have a physical bookshop. So our office is number 70 and it's full of books, our books, our private library. Number 70, and, uh, uh, Lebo Ache, number 70 Lebo Ache, uh, which is right next to Aminin Street. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, Aminin Street, the, uh, we also had the Sunet Sen Museum, but the Sunet Sen Museum, we actually had to close in March because we knew that there were not going to be any tourists. And then, yeah. so we had, um, we had only uh, one staff and we had to let him go. I mean, it's a very good staff. And so anyway, so we focus more on the book business, but even then, um, so anyway, we have the publishing office and then we have the bookshop right next to it. And the bookshop used to be in um, the Star Pit Street, but then we moved you know, back to, I mean, it's easier actually to have both side by side. Uh, although that was a very nice, those were very nice premises, but it, there's, there's also advantages to having the bookshop next, next door. And so now like when people come and see us, so we meet them in the bookshop, you know? Uh, and, and um, the bookshop is kind of like, it's not, we don't carry book on politics, for example. So we, and we don't carry a lot of books that are available like through Amazon, you know, or you can just order online from uh, other bookshops. So we just carry very, uh, quite specialized collection. And we have um, mainly English books and Malay books, not so many Chinese books, um, but we do, do have a few. If it's like about Penang and all that, then we will carry it. So our books are mainly on Malaysian uh, history, heritage, culture, but we have five themes. One is, um, and our public, our publishing also follows these five areas. Okay, so history for sure, heritage, mm -hmm. cultural heritage, and then uh, um, visual arts, architecture, and well, we also have performing arts actually, but. Um, and then architecture and environment. So we, uh, I think um, there are not many environmental publishers around and we have a number of, and there are not many publishers on architecture around. So we have been told that we are like, you know, the, one of the leading uh, publishers on architecture and environment. Um, and then culture, maybe culture as well, you know, cultural history, heritage. So these are actually our five, you know, main areas. And uh, it's really, you know, it's about the Malaysian landscape, right? The, the physical, the geographical, the human landscape, you know? So if you read like the, the books that we have, um, our, our own books, which is almost like 50 titles, right? Mm -hmm. And also the books that we carry, then you have a quite a good understanding about the kind of human geography and, um, you know, it's, it provides a lot of context. Uh, your books, I think Sorry? Probably at the bookshelf behind me. I actually have a couple. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So this one and the other one is on uh, Little India. A... Little India, yes, yeah. yes. So that's a beautiful photography book yeah. by uh, Dr. Wei Chengi. And so the Posa, um, I think many people buy it and then it takes them one year to read it because it's so thick. It's like 600 pages. It is, it is. I but spent the... nearly a month and I barely got through 20 pages. <laughs> yeah, but actually there's a lot of groundbreaking uh, history because you know, we use a lot of documents and maps to try and piece together what, what actually happened. And um, so uh, somebody actually said to, to us that, you know, to my husband, uh, you know, people write about the victors of history, but you're the only one who writes about the, the people who lost, uh, the losers, right? Uh, and that, that is a story to tell. Because, uh, in that, they say history is always written by the victor, uh, which may not necessarily be, be the only narrative, I think. It's important to also present the counter-narratives and the alternatives on a layman's take on it. So basically, we, we are writing history so that everybody can find their place in it. Mm. You know, so if you have ancestors who came certain time, whatever. So mm. this is the sort of history we're interested in. It's social history. It's basically everybody has a place in that history because everybody has a story to tell and 
uh, you know, help to build the country and, you know, so that's the kind of, um, but there, there are also winners and losers. And uh, of course there is contestation. There's always contestation throughout history. And um, so that, that we do have like a following among history buffs, right? And these are history buffs and, you know, so they, they will like, uh, but they, of course it's in Malaysia, it's not, not a big uh, group of people. Um, and and these and friends and you know, the the friends and people who, you know, uh, you know this community actually contributes a lot as well. Sometimes they say, "Hey, have you? Do you have this photograph?" You know, and then uh, I mean, it's very exciting to see a photograph that is in somebody's private collection or somebody found it and then, you know, and shares it with us, and we can also reproduce it. So that's uh, uh, that's wonderful. All right. Uh, okay. One time constraint where I think we're run about one hour now. Uh, so one last question, also addressed to Von Salma. Uh, if the younger generation would like to do what you're doing, uh, how do they start and what would you advise? Yeah, actually we have had a number of interns before and um, I don't think any of them actually went into publishing after that, I'm not sure. <laughs> but um, it's, you know, like, like I said, in Malaysia, it's very difficult to, to find jobs in publishing. Um, and uh, so, that, but there are, you know, publishers elsewhere and there are actually now a lot of things are online, right? And, and people write online, they write for online media. And, uh, you know, they, uh, so actually uh, many of us also have a journalistic background. Um, like many people who are involved in writing now, maybe used to be journalists, okay, for example. And uh, so that's people who, who you usually want to write, they go into journalism. And then after that, they, you know, I mean, in Malaysia, lah, they go somewhere else. And then uh, in other places, sometimes you can get into publishing. But we do, we, I mean, in the past, we have had a lot of interns. Maybe now, because of MCO and all that, it's also very difficult. So um, it's, it's not an easy journey. Lah. It's not an easy journey. And, and we're still very niche, even though it's been around for such a long time, but we're still a very niche publisher. You know, we're not big in any way, right? But uh, we have been, you know, sort of consistently at it uh, for more than 15 years now. And hopefully, you know, uh, we, we also, yeah. And the other thing is that, um, uh, you know, in many, in many places, actually publishers also try to get, I mean, especially when you have a very small market. Okay, in Malaysia, it's difficult because the market, the ling ling language market is very fragmented. Mm -hmm. That means uh, you have so many people reading English and so many people reading in Malay and so many people reading in Chinese or Tamil, right? Mm -hmm. So your Malaysian population is already fragmented along, those, uh, along the language readership. So Malaysia population is not very big in the first place. So um, we do have, uh, you know, people who are non-Malaysians who read our books, obviously. So maybe, you know, you have a mixture of local people reading it, Malaysians, uh, Penang people, Malaysians, um, you know, tourists or expats and also Malaysians staying abroad. So you need all these people, all these groups of people to actually make up that market. And uh, now, like I said, we are also starting to produce um, books in Malay because there is a Malay readership. Uh, especially in the Klang Valley, and certain titles can be, you know, produced in Malay. So uh, um, this uh, readership thing is because uh, of our fragmented readership. So the readership is always very small. So it's, it will never be like New York Times bestseller or anything like that because you know we just don't have that. Uh, if, I mean English English language readership. Um, so. Um, because of that, that maybe, the you know, of, yeah. um, does that raise the issue of uh, the Arita books being sustainable in the long run? And uh, I mean, it's been around for quite a while, but do you foresee hmm. that you'll be able to continue to sustain this? I, I don't know. It's, it's a very difficult time for everyone, and we really don't know whether we can sustain, but you know, um, the, the, the the, I told you the latest book. Huh? So we went, this time we didn't even use my starter. We went on just WhatsApp fundraising. <laughs> and we managed to uh, get, I think something like, uh, I mean, we have pre-sold about 300, 300 books maybe. Oh, wow. Pre-sold, yeah, yeah. 
So, you know, so that, that really helps. So now actually we just go on WhatsApp or Facebook or whatever it is. Lah, because people know us by, by now and, you know, and, uh, and, and they know, uh, you know, there's a, there's a series after Sutta Posta, right? So the people who read Sutta Posta, so they, in fact, a lot of people were saying that, why didn't you publish it in Malay? So the Malay version is coming up. I don't know when, but it will, there will be a Malay version. <laughs> So it's being translated or is that it's, it's totally rewritten and, and you cannot um, really translate, you know, I mean, you can translate some book, but in this case, it's totally re rewritten for a Malay market so that it resonates, you know, the resonance is very important. So you want the, the language, you know, the ideas, uh, um, I mean, what is important to the Malay readership. So the, all these things have to resonate with the readership. Yeah. And, and, uh, so, okay, so actually my husband is writing Malay and I started editing in Malay, believe it or not. My Malay is not that good, actually. But I can tell like when a sentence, there's something wrong with this sentence. So I just go to him and say, hey, there's something wrong with this sentence. Please correct it. <laughs> Although I can't correct it myself because I can't really write well in Malay. But I, you know, I did get an A1 for my SPM Malay, believe it or not. Even though most of it is out the window. But, you know, I can just see that if there's something or anyway I do also the fact checking and you know cross referencing and all that lah. so we we just manage but uh, I mean really we need a, a Malay editor I mean we are actually in need of a good Malay editor so this was very very difficult it was a struggle <laughs> okay uh, thank you I think we're just about running run out of time so uh, thank you for Sama and also Eddie for, for sharing both your journeys with us uh, anyone who's interested in uh, the Cycle Empire or any other books pu published by Arika Books, they can. Are they all available in your website right now? Yes, I'll be. It'll be on www.arikabooks.com, so you can buy online. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and also I think we have listed some in uh, in creativebrandspinning.com also. Uh, so thank you both uh, so much for your time. Uh, stay safe and good night, everyone. Thank you for having me. Good night. All right. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Stay safe.